Good morning everyone, my name is Francisca Hosch. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital um, and the ATAXA unit. I work with um, Dr. Jeremy Schmarman, who is the director of the ATAXA unit and the um, founder of the um, Laboratory for Neuroanatomy and Cerebral Neurobiology um, at MGH. I am also a um, clinician and um, currently on um, clinical service so I apologize that I cannot be there in person today and um, I hope that this um, video lecture gives you an impression of um, some of our work that we have done in the past um, couple of years and hopefully um, opens up um, the door to more um, research regarding cognition and affect in um, patients with ataxia telangiectasia. So one of the reasons why I got interested in cognition and affect um, in children with ataxia telangiectasia was that when I started working with um, patients with AT as a resident in Germany, um, many parents and also older um, patients reported that um, besides the motor difficulties, um, that their main concern or main um, issues um, were, be besides the motor impairment, were actually cognitive difficulties. Um, some parents reported that um, children had difficulty with emotion regulation, so they had a difficult time processing sad or happy events. Um, other patients reported that they had difficult time processing um, a certain amount of information in school. So if they had to read things, they were they had more difficulties memorizing things. Um, they had difficulties finding words, word fluency, um, and things like that. So um, there were many open questions, and um, there was not there was actually nothing in the literature in the literature that helped us. Um, or help me as a clinician understand what what could be the cause of the um, cognitive difficulties that patients and parents describe. What we know about cerebellar ataxia is that it comprises a prominent motor syndrome um, that comprises ataxia of the upper and lower extremities, which we call dysmetria of movement. Um, you notice this when the patient um, has a targeted movement that the extremity is very um, tremorous, um, the arms and the legs are not very well coordinated. Um, gait instability and um, um, difficulties with speech um, and clarity of speech are the most prominent sim symptoms in uh, the cerebellar motor syndrome. However, in addition to the cerebellar motor syndrome, we also know that there are cognitive issues in patients who have cerebellar pathology. Um, these cognitive issues have been first described by um, Jeremy Schmarman um, in 1998, who um, looked at a group of 20 patients with cerebellar tumors. Both, uh, all of those patients were adults. And he found that these patients had specific cognitive changes that comprised a variety of cognitive areas. And he called this complex of cognitive symptoms the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. Um, I will tell you more about um, what the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome comprises. I just want to let you know um, that we did a study in the past two years um, where we looked at how we can develop a rating scale for adults with cerebellar injury um, in order to diagnose whether they have the CCS or not. Um, and this rating scale has been published in December 2017 in Brain um, and is currently being translated into a variety of uh, languages. Um, and. Um, we currently have a study um, on the way that is looking at developing a 
um, CCAS is cerebellar cognitive effect, affective syndrome rating scale for children with cerebellar um, injury or dis diseases. Um, we hope that this scale will be available soon. Regarding the cognitive problems in patients who have the CCAS, um, here are just a few examples. We notice that they can have difficulties with spatial ish, um, with spatial construction. Um, they can have difficulties with um, sentence formation. But these are just a few examples. I will get into more detail about the you know, CCS, the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, in the next slide. So as I mentioned in the last slide, um, it has become evident in the past few decades that cerebellar disease can affect cognitive function and emotional processing, as well as motor control. The constellation of deficits that we find in the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, also called CCAS or Schmalman syndrome, is our executive dysfunction, spatial cognition deficits, language processing deficits, and changes with affect regulation. In more detail, um, you can imagine that affective changes include personality changes. Um, patients report that um, they get easily upset or that um, a patient who is an adult um, um, reacts um, overly um, emotional to a situation that um, he, usually an adult would react not as emotional to. Um, I had patients who mentioned that they received a birthday gift and they were um, crying uh, for um, a prolonged period of time without um, any reason to cry. Like, you, of course, they could cry for a short time, but they, it was very hard to... Um, calm them down. Um, the opposite is also true. It could be that they get very upset about um, small um, things or triggers and um, their family members have a hard time uh, calming them down. Um, other affective changes um, are um, withdrawal. Um, some patients have uh, a very limited um, range of emotions um, some people may say um, patients who have movement disorders they are um, exposed to a lot of negative impact um, both with their disease as well as um, their from their surrounding um, they may be depressed and may have uh, withdrawal um, sim symptoms based on that um, in our study, the depression inventory that we um, administered um, um, was not giving us any indication that they scored significantly um, higher um, or significant uh, for clinical um, diagnosis of depression. However, they still scored high on withdrawal and uh, um, affective changes, as I will tell you in the next slides. Um, regarding language deficits, um, language deficits in the study by in in the studies by Schmalman and colleagues, and in our study with adults, um, showed that there there were expressive but also receptive language deficits, and <coughs> more frequently and more prominent, there were um, verbal fluency deficits. So patients had difficulties um, accessing the um, accessing verbal pools, um, so um, it took them longer time to find a word. Um, and family members reported that um, the patient usually knows the word, but he has a hard time just expressing the word or um, finding the word. Regarding spatial deficits, there is a variety of issues. Um, it, um, includes recognizing different shapes and forms, but also producing or um, coming up with um, three-dimensional shapes, as I will show you in uh, the next slide. 
And then executive function deficits include planning, set shifting, which is um, um, shifting focus from one task to the next, um, verbal fluency, um, abstract reasoning, and working memory. Working memory is short-term memory. So if the teacher in school says, um, please um, write down the following information, a patient or an adult with cerebellar ataxia um, in the study with adults um, <coughs> showed um, these adults showed that they had difficulties memorizing things or um, phone numbers or daily, you know, just very short daily tasks that they were that they were supposed to memorize. They were not able to memorize those um, or had difficulties and needed cues. The basis for the cognitive findings that we have in ataxia patients or patients with cerebellar injury, um, the anatomical basis is that we think that there are, is a specific connection or circuitry between cerebral cognitive associative cortices and the cerebellum. There is a multitude of imaging studies um, available, um, most prominent or most Significant are the um, um, fMRI connectional um, fMRI um, imaging studies, um, particularly these studies done by um, Buckner um, and colleagues in 2011 and 2013, who um, um, show that there is a specific functional connectivity between. Um, cognitive associative cortices and the cerebellum, especially those areas of the cerebellum that are that we know of are not primarily motor um, related. Um, we know that um, the cere there are cer areas within the cerebellum um, that l are not as active with motor tasks as others. And the question for years has been. Um, what do these areas of the cerebellum that um, are obviously not active um, for motor functions, what are they used for? And these neuroimaging studies um, tell us now that these areas are active with cognitive tasks or um, correlate with um, activity levels in cere um, cerebellar cognitive associative areas, telling us that there is some connection between um, areas of the brain that process cognitive function and the cerebellum. So there are a few examples actually for cognitive deficits in patients with, in children with cerebellar lesions. Um, there are only a few studies in children or actually no detailed studies in children with neurodegenerative diseases such as AT, but um, there are or there have been a couple, a handful of studies um, in um, children with um, cerebellar tumors. Um, one of those studies um, was done by Levison and Schmarman in 2000, and they looked at children after they looked at children after um, cerebellar tumor removal. They did not receive any chemotherapy or any um, adjunct. Um, therapy that could have interfered with their um, cognitive um, performance. And what they found was actually that these children um, presented with the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, the CCS. They had issues problem solving. Um, they had difficulties with visual, visual spatial um, recognition, working memory, um, expressive language issues, um, poor word finding, um, naming deficits and also um, regulation of affect, um, all of those areas comprising the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. So in this study of AT children, uh, we wanted to know do children with AT present signs of the CCS? How do we diagnose the CCS? Um, can we actually tell that from our study material or from the study results? Which of our tests are um, sensitive to detect the cerebellar cognitive affective syn syndrome in um, children with AT? And do our, does our study or do our study results 
um, help us to differentiate cerebellar from non-cerebellar pathology in those children with AT. So what we did in this study, we um, examined or we looked at 20 patients with AT. Uh, the majority of them was genetically confirmed. Um, there were 12 males, 8 females, um, mean age was 9.86 years, the youngest patient was 4.1 years old, and the oldest patient was 23.24. Most of the patients were, um, so the oldest patient, that was there was only one patient who was um, older than 18, 19 years, so that was the maximum age range. Um, we grouped those patients based on age. Um, the first group were toddlers and preschoolers up to 5.9 years of age. The second group of AT children were school children. Um, here the age range was 7.11 years to 9.9 .9 years. And then the third group were teenagers, um, starting with um, the, young, um, the youngest patient in this group was 12.6 years and the oldest patient was 23.2 years. The reason why we grouped them by age um, was that our cognitive test battery basically mandated um, that we group these patients um, based on um, how you score cognitive tests. Um, you have partially different tests in the group of preschoolers and you cannot um, throw a preschooler together with a um, child in a school age group um, for some of those tests. So we had to bin those patients and um, look at um, these groups by age um, in order to allow for, for a comparison between toddlers, school children, and teenagers. So this slide is just an overview, a subset of the results. Um, I will not go over this slide. I just want to show you with this slide that we had, we looked at overall cognitive ability, um, functional scores, IQ, intellectual quotient. Um, we looked at language, a variety of language tests. We looked at a variety of executive function tests, a number of visual spatial um, tests, and a number of attention tests, um, as well as academic performance tests. We looked at motor performance in addition to that. And what, um, uh, um, we also looked at social cognition, which um, I will tell you more about in the, um, one of the next slides. We also had a bunch of um, affect, um, affective and behavioral tests that are not shown on this slide. Um, the paper that is currently under review with cerebellum has um, five results tables so um, that if you are interested you can look those up there. Um, here I will just give you a brief overview of the most important findings. First of all the main finding um, that we had was a prominent visual spatial processing deficit or difficulties in the youngest age group. Um, the preschoolers and toddlers were overall fine on their entire cognitive test battery, but um, where they had deficits was in the visual spatial domain. These deficits were subtle, but they fell slightly below the average range of normal performance. Um, which um, tells us that they, there is an early onset, um, there are early difficulties of visual spatial processing. Um, this might be related to cognitive understanding of how to integrate two-dimensional or three-dimensional shapes. Um, it also may be related to the cerebellar motor deficit. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are not just um, um, upper and lower extremity difficulties, but we know um, that cerebellar patients have difficulty with um, tracking. Um, they have saccadic um, 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 eye movements. They 
have um, difficulties with um, following targets with, with their eyes. Um, so visual difficulties may be related to the cerebellar underlying oculomotor difficulties that the patients have. Um, but we s the findings that we have in this study are very similar to um, patients that, or the results that we had in a study with the adults. Um, so we still have to find out if everything is really just related to motor, to oculomotor, to the um, difficulties of um, following along with the eyes, or if there is a cognitive component. The one thing that supports the finding that there is at least partially a cognitive component is that patients are able to um, copy shapes that are two-dimensional, but they struggle with three-dimensional shapes. So um, some of our older patients um, in the AT2, like in the school church, church in the children, um, in, the, in the school kids, um, and as well as in, in the teenagers, if you look at the star and the cube um, in the lower part of the slide, you see that the patients were able to copy the star, the five-pointed star, you see that they have motor difficulties, but they are still able to make out the shape and come up with um, a pretty good copy. But when they were presented with the cube, they had difficulty reconstructing the three-dimensional shape. Um, they drew two-dimensional pictures. They drew too many lines, partially. They just, um, here, if you look at um, P21, in the right lower corner, <coughs> this patient um, completely separated those um, sides of the cube, um, which tells us that there is some three-dimensional processing deficit that is not just related to the oculomotor um, apraxia that these patients have. Um, another interesting finding that we had um, with a, a test that is called the ray figure um, is that older patients, um, school children who were presented with the ray figure here on the left, this um, schematic drawing, um, they were not able to copy this figure. So they were presented with the figure, they could look at the figure, but the copy was actually fragmented. So you see the patient's copy um, in the lower part of the image, um, there are many fragmented colorful parts and pieces that are present in the original figure, but they are disintegrated. Again, similar to what you see in the cube copy um, down here in the slide is very similar to the ray figure, how they copied the ray figure um, in comparison to healthy control on, um, above in the upper part of the image. Now, if you move to the right um, and you look at immediate recall for the ray figure, the healthy control um, has some memory of the ray figure. Um, for the AT patient, the figure is actually still fragmented, but has now less detail, which also tells us that there is some visual memory problem as well. Um, we did a couple of other tests. One of them is called VMI. The other one is um, called um, motor-free visual perceptual test. <coughs> um, patients performed um, below average um, and um, borderline and impaired on those tests, um, telling us that there is a prominent visual spatial processing deficit. Now, as a parent, you may ask how does this present in daily life um, so children could have difficulty with um, geometry if they were presented with tasks that require um, visual processing some parents mentioned that um, their older AT children just cannot memorize um, the way to school or they get lost um, because they cannot memorize when to take a path 
left or right um, it is um, or they have difficulties um, finding their way on maps if it's older kids um, so it has uh, it can present in a variety of um, situations the next group or category of difficulties that we found in patients is very similar to the CCAS again are executive function deficits so um, in this category we looked at attention span we looked at working memory which is the short-term memory that I mentioned earlier we looked at processing speed we looked at sequencing which is um, is the ability to understand um, an order or understand and memorize order of certain things um, we looked at planning how well are patients able to plan ahead pattern recognition um, we also looked at multitasking and um, here in this slide you see um, above the um, blue columns um, in the executive function graph the blue columns are the older patients 82 and 83 um, the school children and the teenagers and the red uh, in the red columns are um, the school children um, and partially the toddlers um, and um, you see um, here we plotted those as z-scores and a z-score of minus one is kind of where we set the cutoff for um, below average performance and you see that patients had difficulties with processing speed um, back surge and cancellation are processing speed tests we mentioned in the paper and we mentioned here I want to mention here that Bug surge and cancellation tests, we know that these are tests that have motor requirements. Um, but we did have other tests in the battery as well that were um, motor free, such as um, sequencing tests or digit span tests. And we saw that patients, if they are not timed on those tests, that they still have difficulty with um, pattern recognition, multitasking, um, and short-term short memory. Um, we did a couple of other tests in the lower chart here in the lower graph. You see, um, again, the um, um, blue bars and the red bars. Uh, this time, the blue bars are the preschoolers and the um, red bars are the school children and older children. Um, we um, administered a working memory test and a picture memory test in the preschoolers. Um, Performance here was as I'm, um, was actually within normal limit. It was below average, but still within normal range. And I mentioned that earlier that the AT1 group, the preschoolers were performed well on um, the majority of tests, except for the visual spatial test. Um, but then if you look at the school children here, there are difficulties with um, digit span, which is a memorization of a sequence of numbers. Um, both forward and backward, which, has, which tells us that there is some um, short-term memory and also attention um, difficulty component here. We did another test um, with the older patients, which is called card sorting test. Um, the patients did not have to sort the cards or um, place the cards on the table. Um, the examiner did this for them, um, but this test showed that they have had prominent difficulties recognizing patterns. Um, and um, setting um, with cognitive set shift, um, which means that they were not able to um, recognize changing patterns um, as well. The next domain that we looked at was language. And for the preschoolers and toddlers, I have to say that this domain was as well fine they performed fine here you can see that in blue the preschoolers on uh, several um, um, language tests of a standard cognitive test battery the Wechsler scale um, they were with a normal limit or even above average um, the two bars here um, in the 0 0.8 range just is above average performance um, the school children and older children on the standard tests they were still with an average, but they performed lower than the younger children. Um, 
we administered a couple of other tests that were experimental tests um, that showed us that there might be actually more difficulties in the older children that we see on these standard tests. Um, but overall, language seems to be one of the areas that is um, most preserved. However, I want to give a note of caution here that um, some, some of the cognitive tests may not be able to detect the difficulties that um, AT or cerebellar children have specifically within the language domain. They may be too broad or too superficial to touch those difficulties. So um, I know when I speak with parents that they mention um, they, their, their child looks for words more than others. Um, on the other hand, there are sometimes patients who, who were, or parents that report that the patient is able to come up with words that the parents think he has never heard of, um, but then on the other hand has difficulty with um, sentence formation. So they just um, speak in very short abbreviated sentences, one or two word sentences, um, which is um, unusual for their age. If a 16 year old says, um, I want the ball, this is not an appropriately formed sentence for a 16 year old. Um, we did not test for sentence formation formally in this study because it is uh, it adds more time and patients um, um, had already an ex um, um, a very comprehensive test battery. But it is certainly something to look into in the future, um, especially given that parents and um, patients report that they have difficulty with um, sentence formation and language. Um, that being said, the studies, uh, the tests that we administered in this study did show some change between the youngest and the oldest patients, but overall pa pr patients performed within normal, normal range here. The last domain of the CCS of the cognitive affective syndrome that we looked at was affect and emotion regulation. We had a variety of different tests, both experimental and um, standard cognitive tests. Um, we also had a parent interview um, that we administered. And overall, um, the majority of patients um, was reported to have a subset of symptoms that is not always present, but in some situations, um, these symptoms come up and parents report that um, there are behaviors that are present that are more exaggerated than usual for the age group. So uh, parents reported aggressiveness, biting, hitting, pinching in um, some of the patients. Um, some patients had um, certain avoidance of foods or textures. Um, some displayed repetitive behaviors. Some parents mentioned they are, they are not aware of social boundaries, such as um, a family goes to the goes to a restaurant and um, um, an older AT patient makes an uh, inappropriate comment about um, the waitress. Um, 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 other children behave childish or immature for their age. Others are distractive, impulsive, and some of them had uh, frequent temper tantrums. And some of them, as I mentioned earlier, um, showed withdrawal. And um, in one of our scales that we administered, it is called CNRS. It's an exper experimental uh, rating scale. We saw that um, parents endorsed um, prominent attentional difficulties, emotional regulation difficulties. Some patients, but the min minority, had symptoms that belong to the autism spectrum range, but these were only a very small number of patients, such as the repetitive behaviors. Um, a small number of patients um, showed psychosis spectrum behaviors, but this was also just the minority, um, um, a ver like a two out of 20 patients. Um, the majority of parents endorsed social skill deficits, which, which includes, as I mentioned earlier, emotion regulation, 
immature behaviors um, um, and unawareness of social boundaries. One interesting test that we looked at regarding social cognition was another um, experimental test uh, that is called reading the eyes, reading the mind in the eyes test. Um, this test looks at how well patients are able to um, derive an emotion from looking at people's eyes. Um, there are different ver ver versions of this test. Um, there's another um, researcher who developed um, um, emotion recognition tasks from entire f um, f pictures of the face, um, from pictures of the entire face called the Ackman Faces Test. Um, we used uh, this test because we have uh, we knew from uh, another study that we did in 2016 and it is actually now published um, that uh, where we looked at adults with cerebral disorders that had difficulty um, 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 with emotion recognition on this task. Um, for the AT study, we used <coughs> the child version of this test. We also used um, two standard cognitive tests of emotion recognition and affect recognition from faces um, and compared those tests. Um, here I just want to show you the results of the experimental tests. Um, and we found that um, the older AT patients had prominent difficulty um, decoding or recognizing um, positive emotions from those faces. Um, this is an interesting finding. Um, it is difficult to explain at this time why they have more difficulty with um, positive emotion decoding or why m there may be more difficulties with that. Um, we certainly have to do more research but uh, to and look into that. Um, there may be a correlation with the cerebellar connectivity that I explained to you earlier. Um, we know that the cerebellum has prominent um, connections to areas that process both fear, um, anxiety, but also positive emotions in the brain. So that might be one um, explanation, but there are certainly other explanations why patients may have difficulty decoding positive emotions. Um, from these results, it is also difficult to say how this may translate into um, daily life. Um, however, one could suggest that um, if a patient has difficulty um, decoding positive emotions, he may be more um, he may be more prone to um, interpreting someone's behaviors as threatening or scary or fearful, and that this may lead to symptoms. Um, such as exaggerated crying or um, withdrawal. However, this is just speculative. At this time, it is um, difficult to say how, um, what the exact impact of these um, emotion decoding difficulties is in, in a clinical setting. So to summarize the findings in this study, the youngest patients, um, the youngest AT patients, the toddlers, did great on language, executive functions, and um, the effect, effect, effective changes, the behavioral measures. Where we saw deficits or difficulties was in the visual spatial domain. Both visual spatial perception, which means what you what you perceive, what you take in as an as a visual information, and construction. How can you interpret and mm, and manipulate the visual information that you have? Um, early stage or toddlers, young children with AT did fine on IQ and overall intellectual functioning. But um, once we looked into older children, school children, teenagers, and adolescents. At this time, not just visual spatial processing and perception difficulties were present, but we also found prominent executive 
function difficulties, short-term memory difficulties. Um, some patients, those patients who could take, who, who were able to complete academic testing tasks, showed um, lower scores on those. Um, there were select aspects of social cognitive, emotion recognition, and emotion regulation difficulties, and um, language performance. Expressive language was in a low normal range, um, where we saw that dif difference between the younger patients that performed actually really good and the older patients, um, which suggests that there might be actually also some language difficulty. Um, evolving over the course of um, the disease. Um, the overall complex of difficulties then resulted in um, functional IQ scores that were below normal range. Um, and we are, we interpret the findings in the older patients um, as such that we know that the cerebellar um, injury, the cerebellar degeneration, is a process that continues over time. Similar to the um, cerebellar motor syndrome, the, the movement difficulties that the patients have, um, we know that the movement difficulty evolves over time. We know it gets patients um, do not start off in a wheelchair, um, but they um, have progressive movement um, disorder and difficulties. And I think we see something similar here, obviously, in um, on the cognitive domain, um, which suggests that the ongoing neurodegeneration does not just affect um, motor performance, but also affects cognition. Um, and one of the questions that you may have is, is there a correlation between motor performance and cognitive performance. And we, when we looked at this statistically, we see that visual spatial um, perception is linked or is a there's a correlation between visual spatial deficits and um, worsening motor scores, um, which may be related to uh, the underlying motor disorder or it may be related to um, uh, the cerebellar area that is affected um, uh, that's causing the motor difficulty and the visual spatial difficulty just to be affected and teach, like have progressive changes um, at the same rate. It is very difficult to see right now, but there is an association. Um, we also saw an association with um, overall IQ and motor scores, which also again could just be related to um, age. We know that the older patients have higher scores or perform worse on cerebellar motor, motor, motor scores. And we know in this study, uh, from the data in this study, that the older patients also have lower IQ scores. So it's hard to say here if there's a functional relation between um, motor impairment and um, the overall IQ impairment. I, uh, we think that the combination of the CCAS, the combination of the cognitive deficits leads to a combined inter IQ impairment and the separate subdomains, visual, spatial, social cognition, um, language, and um, um, executive function, um, they are functionally probably different. Um, there are different areas in the, within the cerebellum that we know of that are related to these functions that may um, be part of the neurodegenerative process in the cerebellum that must not be primarily related to the motor areas that, degener that have degenerative processes um, in AT or that show degenerative processes in AT. Um, that being said, and there's no imaging data at this time in AT to tell us more about um, which areas of the cerebellum are actually processing cognitive um, functions and if they are affected by um, cerebellar degeneration over the course of um, time in AT. So um, to conclude this talk or this presentation,
um, the results of this study in AT patients, um, in, in, in this American AT patient um, cohort, um, strongly suggests a role of cerebellar and cerebrocerebellar circuitries for cognitive development and cognitive prognosis in AT. Um, we do not yet know what the underlying neurobiology in AT is um, and how it affects cognitive changes in AT, um, which gives us more, um, more area to um, do research on, which is actually um, important because it has a major impact on these families, on families and patients with AT. Um, we also um, looked at a cognitive phenotype genotype correlation in this study that I did not mention. We had two patients um, that had a milder motor presentation. These two patients also showed um, better um, cognitive scores or better cognitive performance. Um, but the number of patients who have these mild variants, they are very rare. So it is difficult to give like a statistical a significant, uh, like a significant result at this time with just uh, describing a trend. Um, but um, we saw that there is a trend. The better the motor performance or the milder the presentation of an AT patient, the better the cognitive performance. And last, um, this study um, again shows um, that um, we urgently need more um, research to evaluate or to find um, support and treatment for these cognitive difficulties, not just the motor difficulties. It is, um, I think we neglected the cognitive and behavioral difficulties for a long period of time in not just AT, but in general children with cerebellar lesions. It could be tumors, it could be um, 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 infections, etc. cetera. Um, we now start working on um, those disorders um, and we see that there is a big big need for um, research and support uh, to help families um, not just with cognitive um, supportive measures but hopefully in the, f um, in the future also with um, measures that improves or Im hopefully prevents cognitive um, um, decline. Um, this, of course, again is related to the general research in 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 AT. Um, there are several um, groups um, that are very active on promoting research for AT children. Um, this study was founded by the AT Children's Project, and um, the AT Children's Project is one of the main. Um, um, research um, promoting patient um, networks, patient gro groups that uh, we have in the U.S. that helps us um, um, support our um, research studies. So hopefully um, in the near future we can come up with um, not just supportive but also treatment interventions for both the cognitive and the overall um, clinical presentation in AT. So with this, um, I want to end my talk, my presentation. And there were a couple of collaborators on this study. Um, my mentor, PI, Dr. Jeremy Schmarman, who is um, has been very supportive of um, this research and is currently, we are currently working on developing the CCS, the CCS scale for children as well. Um, um, Dr. Dali was the psychologist on this study. Dr. Sherman was the supervising psychologist. And then um, several research students and uh, research assistants. And we also want to thank the AT Children's Project. Um, we were also funded by the National Ataxia Foundation and several other grants. Um, so with that, I want to apologize that I could not be there in person um, to talk to you um, today but I hope that this talk gave you an insight into um, the
um, area of non-motor cerebellar difficulties that patients with AT can have um, that has long been overlooked. And um, one of the main messages that we do have for patients and families with AT is that we know that um, the not just the motor but also the cognitive difficulties cause a lot of strain and a lot of a lot of um, um, burden on the families um, and um, um, daily living skills, uh, daily living qual quality of daily life. Um, we want to let you know that this research, not just this study, but all the research that um, in the past 10 years, there's a lot of research that just supports that the cognitive difficulties that are present in children with AT and in other patients with cerebral disorders are not made up. They are not just um, these patients, the patients don't make them up. There is a reason for, for, for these difficulties, which is um, in the neurodegenerative process of the cerebellum and the cerebrocerebellar circuitries. And if we have the opportunity um, in the near future to um, further work on these um, on the new, on understanding which areas of the cerebellum and the circuitry is involved in these processes, um, hopefully we can target um, our um, treatment intervention towards not just improving the motor difficulties but also the cognitive and behavioral changes. So I hope I wish you um, all the best and. Um, um, I hope all of you have had a great um, week and a great um, um, conference. Thank you so much. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take questions by email um, um, anytime. Thank you so much.